Hey everybody, it's Derek Hall Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you've watched any of my videos on event sourcing or just getting into it, there's a common set of questions that I always get asked, as well as a few issues that I always see people run into. Things like CRUD sourcing, communication, and optimization. Let me tackle them. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So the first issue or question that I often see, most people refer to as CRUD sourcing. And this is because there's kind of this shift. If you're typically writing applications, we're just maintaining current state, and you have a really a UI driven by CRUD, so create, read, update, delete. So the user just has a form for some entity, basically using some type of entity service, and you're just really providing action so they can update an entity as a whole. It's really not based on driven by tasks or business capabilities. It's just let the user modify or update data however they see fit. So where this goes wrong is translating kind of that CRUD into events, which we end up calling CRUD sourcing. So you end up with events like product created or product updated or product deleted. And it may get a little bit more kind of property based to product quantity updated or product price changed. Now to me, the value in event sourcing is understanding these state changes, but the business reasons why these things occurred and it's capturing that, that's where the value is. So it's not just necessarily about the CRUD actions because okay, yes, yeah, state changed. I get it, there was some transition there. But what was the reason? What was the business implications of why this happened? There's a big difference between product quantity updated and product price changed versus inventory adjusted or price increased. So if we did a stock count, which is some type of business function in a warehouse, and we found some new products, we go into our system and we do an inventory adjustment. And that results in inventory being adjusted. That's the event. We know why the quantity on hand for a product changed versus the product quantity changed. Like, why did it change? It's because there was an inventory adjustment. Same thing with the price. Oh, the price changed. Why? Well, because we did a price increase, that was our action, and it result, resulted in our event of price increased. So if we want to get explicit about the events that we're saving to our event stream, that means that we need to push this out farther up to the client so that we can get that information. So instead of having a CRUD form here where I can just go and change the quantity on hand, again, how am I supposed to derive an inventory adjusted event from this? So we need to move away from CRUD and more guide the users to let them perform the actions that they need to for their job. So if they're, we need to do an inventory adjustment, that's something explicit that we define. That's gonna be some type of UI, a task that's gonna basically generate a command. And from that command, we know explicitly we're doing an inventory adjustment. So once that is saved, that's validated, we create our event. Guess what event we're creating? Inventory adjusted. So the idea here, is kind of get out of that crud mentality and more towards what are the actual business events and things that are part of a process that are actually happening. Be explicit. So probably the most common question I get related to event sourcing when people actually understand what it is, is they want to optimize. So here's my example. I have a, a stream of four product, ABC123, and our first event is product received. Then we append another event, product received again for five, so now we're at 15. We have product shipped, so now we're reducing some quantity, so now we're at nine. And then we do an inventory adjustment, so inventory adjusted of 50. So our current state at this point is 59. So if we were needing to perform some type of action and say building up an aggregate, what our aggregate would do is it would basically pull this entire event stream, all the events from this stream, and start at the very index zero, that first one, and go through all the events to get to current state. And our current state, say for keeping track of quantity, is 59. So when people realize this, their immediate reaction is, uh-oh, well, what happens if I have a stream, for example, product ABC123, that has thousands or hundreds of thousands of events? Isn't that gonna be really suboptimal? Like that's gonna take a long time to pull all that data and to rebuild current state. So while this is actually a fair and good question, there's an answer to this, which is snapshots, and I'll get to that in a second. But that's kind of an optimization 
that you don't necessarily need to have often. I say this because in my experience, event streams are generally finite. They kind of have some beginning and end. And within that, it may be a long time duration, but the number of events within an event stream is usually somewhat limited to the point where there is no optimization of needed of creating a snapshot. So my first thing would be more so be looking at what that boundary is of your event stream to make sure that it really is kind of isolated to the events that you actually need to record for representing all those state changes, all those things that are occurring. And if you really do need to go down the path of optimizing that because it's there's so many events and it's taking too long to pull that data and rebuild state, then take a look at snapshots. So the idea with snapshots is just recording kind of a point in time of what state looks like so that when you want to rebuild your aggregate, you're not starting from index zero of your event stream. Rather, what you're doing is you're starting from a snapshot and then getting all the events that have occurred since that snapshot was taken. So what that looks like is we have a product received, product received, product shipped, and maybe we have a threshold of, in my example, it's only four. That's absurd it's for example purposes here. This may be thousands of events depending on what your use case is. So in my case with four, at four I realize, okay, that's too many, that's what our threshold is. So I create a snapshot. The snapshot represents a point in time of after that fourth event, this is what where our current state is. So I record quantity is 59. And I also record where I am in the stream so that when I load my snapshot, I see, okay, I was at this, it was taken from version three. So that way that's this, um, say this is version zero. The last one is version three. So that way I get all the events after that has occurred. So then I can replay just from that point on. But again, before you go down the road of taking snapshots, take a hard long look at what the boundary is of that event stream to make sure that it is correct. Maybe it needs to be modeled differently. Now that you realize that in a lot of use cases, these things are finite. So again, before you go down that road of snapshotting, kind of relook at what these event streams represent. So the last thing I want to touch on here is people not treating events that you use for state, but also treating them as a, those same events as a way to communicate with other service boundaries. So I have a service here, we're doing event sourcing within this logical boundary, and I have an event store. Within that logical boundary, I also likely have, if I'm do, creating projections, I have some type of other database that I'm using kind of for my read side, for my queries. This could be a document database, this could be a relational database, whatever the case may be. But this is what's housing our projections, and there could be many of them. So again, this is within kind of this logical boundary of we have the service, we have our event store, which is our point of truth, and then we have potentially other databases that are for our query purposes, for our read model. Now, most likely you're building your read model, your projections asynchronously, meaning you have some process that's pulling events from the event store or has subscriptions to get the events so it can update its read model, its query side asynchronously. Now, just because you have events that are an event stream, that are in an event store that provides different types of subscription models that doesn't allow, for example, service B to just subscribe and pull out those events in your event store. No, because your event store isn't about communication with other service boundaries, it's about state. You can be using that event store, again, within your own logical boundary to be updating projections and using its subscription model for that, but that doesn't give service B the access to it. Just like there's no way that if you had service A interacting with service B, would you reach out to its relational database directly? Again, you wouldn't do that because it represents state. Don't confuse your event stream, that is events that are used within a logical boundary to represent state, with event streams and events that you use to communicate and integrate with other service boundaries. You may use the exact same infrastructure, maybe use the exact same event store, but don't confuse those different types of event streams and those of events. You have events on the inside, and events on the outside. Your events on the inside are a part of your event stream that represents state within that boundary. You may have different integration events that those are your, the events that you're exposing to integrate with other service boundaries. These likely version differently. They have probably different data that they represent kind of the state changes and the things that have happened. But again, don't conflate kind of state and communication. Events on the inside, events on the outside. 
So hopefully this gives some more insight into some of the common questions or issues that I see. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.